All right, welcome, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to have so many of you joining us this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to the third engagement in our Leading Towards Justice series. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Dr. Dakota Irby to talk about his new book, Stuck Improving, um, along with Dr. William Jackson and Denisha Wee. Uh, this is a monthly series that uh, is gonna continue into June. It's co-sponsored by the Corbally Fund, the Leadership for Learning Program, the Danforth um, Program, and the Just Ed Leadership Institute here at the University of Washington um, and the College of Education. Uh, I'm Ann Ishimara. I'm an Associate Professor of Ed Educational Foundations Leadership and Policy and the Director of the Just Ed Leadership Institute. Sheikh Klawit, good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Craig, uh, Director of the Leadership for Learning Program at the University of Washington College of Education. We're very happy to have all of you with us this afternoon. Uh, honored to have Dr. Irby here with us. Uh, grateful that you're taking time to engage with us uh, and each other as we work to enact leadership towards justice and community well being. We are very excited to be in space with all of you today um, as we get to engage with Stuck Improving, uh, Dr. Irby's new book on racially equity, racial equity in school leadership. Um, and the music you heard as you came in was Dakota Black, um, Dr. Irby's own um, music. So you'll, um, we'll get to hear little bits of that later. And, and uh, if you're interested, you can uh, get the link uh, and uh, get, uh, get access to the music. Uh, as you joined us in some prior engagements, you know we like to invite in multiple modes of um, expression. Um, and so I'm particularly excited to uh, share this work and um, share the brilliance of this book with the UW extended community. Um, some of you know I'm a, a Dr. Derby is a, a collaborator of mine in the Equity Leadership Project, and so I've had the privilege and honor of getting to work with him, and also getting to get some sneak peeks and hear about some of this work over the years. And it is fire, y'all! So I'm so excited that um, you have a chance to engage with him around it. Uh, so this series is, as you know, leading towards justice. And so uh, to do that, we have to begin by acknowledging that we are all on Indigenous lands. Uh, we always are. And here in the University of Washington, we're on the lands of the Duwamish and other Coast Salish peoples um, who've stewarded these lands, the waters and lifeways since time immemorial and are continuing to do so today. So even as we seek to acknowledge and reckon with the dynamics, the ongoing dynamics of settler colonialism, um, we also uh, look to the ongoing leadership the recognition of the, that leadership, wisdom and the relations of indigenous elders, of families, of tribes and communities um, are here amongst us and uh, we're grateful uh, for that. We also want to name and recognize the labor um, of those enslaved um, from Africa and the contributions that were so fundamental um, in building this country. Um, and we also want to just say that, you know, these acknowledgements um, are only a beginning, uh, that we want to ensure that we are leading in ways that are not just uh, acknowledging and making statements like these, but are actually enacting um, solidarities and leading um, in ways that are um, moving in solidarity with indigenous peoples and lands, uh, as well as with black and other communities of color uh, to whom a great debt is owed. Thank you, Anne. Uh, many of you may know I consider Anne a relative and this idea of what it means to acknowledge land with someone like Anne versus when they're empty statements means a lot to me. I am a citizen of the Yakama Nation. I'm a descendant of Suquamish and Puyallup, and I live in the community of the Tulalip tribes. I really believe that all of my work necessarily has to bring justice to these territories. I need to be in collectives like this one uh, with folks who are interested in bringing that justice as well. And um, along with Anne, I really believe in uh, interracial solidarities, cross-racial solidarities. And I think this is a powerful example of what it can look like when we show up together, um, also in relationship with these lands and waters. Uh, second, um, to that notion of what does it really mean to be in these territories, uh, even virtually, we wanna acknowledge uh, the state of the world, uh, the ongoing turmoil, the cumulative effect of everything that's going on around us, um, grief, anxiety, uncertainty. Um, and I also want us to hold peace, wellness, joy, and justice more than anything else. Uh, it's our belief that acknowledging uh, both the peace and the violence the illness and the wellness 
is how we will continue to uh, strike balance toward the beautiful futures we have in mind. Uh, and I want us to take a moment to breathe, but not only that, I wanna bring in what my elders and ancestors have left for us that I'll offer to you. Uh, water during these times, uh, sacred water, chush, we call it, can be um, powerful in uniting us, uh, reminding us where we come from and where we will return, and just encouraging you uh, throughout tonight and any times to have water with you, uh, to drink and hold and remember where we are and what we're up to. Uh, last note, uh, we're recording this session. Um, we'll make it available uh, after the fact for those of you who um, are signed up and we'll, we'll publish that. And there is closed captioning available. It should be in your Zoom bar. And if you have trouble with that, uh, message the hosts and panelists in the chat and we'll help you out. And All right, so as, as you know, if you've been with us uh, since we started in these engagements, our intent is to connect national scholarship with local leaders across programs, across communities, across geographies. So there's a pair, different pair of leaders who have uh, stepped up to help lead our conversation in each of our different um, engagements. And today our conversation is going to be um, uh, facilitated by Dr. William uh, Jackson and Janisha Weave, who are both graduates of our professional educational leadership programs and are current leaders in schools. So Janisha is the assistant principal at Spirit Ridge Elementary School in Bellevue School District, and she's an alumnus of the Danforth Principal Leadership Program. Dr. William Jackson is the principal at Nathan Hale High School in Seattle Public Schools, and he's a graduate of the Leadership for Learning EDD program. We are really delighted that they have agreed to lead us through these engagements, and uh, they are going to introduce Dr. Irby. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ishimaru and uh, Dr. Craig for introducing us. I'm really excited to be here tonight and I hope you all are as well. Um, and I would say just please use the chat uh, for any love, affirmations, questions, any joy uh, that you might have. Um, as we uh, will be able to um, fill those and we'll get to those in a little bit. I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Irby, though, and jump into some of his brilliance that he's brought to us tonight. So, um, uh, Dr. Irby, uh, thank you for being here. And I, he's an associate professor in the Department of Educational Policy uh, Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His research explores how equity-focused school leadership improves Black children and youth's academic achievement and socio-emotional well-being across a range of K-12 educational settings. So uh, Dr. Irby, uh, please jump in and share more about yourself, your journey, and an overview of Stuck Improving. Uh, we will be digging in in a bit about specifics and I have a, a prompt for you, but please jump in and, and share an overview for those who have not had an opportunity to chew on this, this food that you've brought to us tonight. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you all. I really appreciate it. And I'm super excited to uh, have the opportunity to share a little bit about um, my work and specifically about the book Stuck Improving. Um, I want to give a special shout out to my sister, uh, Anne Ishumaru, um, who is just a, a gem of a person. Um, and I know you all know that, but I just wanted to just publicly thank you and acknowledge you and for um, all the contributions in the way that you pushed me to be a better person and a better scholar. Um, so with that in mind, I will move into the book. So the book that I'm gonna be talking about is called uh, Stuck Improving Racial Equity in School Leadership. And I think you all are gonna have to advance my slides. Um, yes, and so the book, I, I wanna start off by just talking a little bit about um, the school setting. So um, in the book, I call this school Central Waters High School, but for now I wanna call it Kevin School um, because all of these schools and these spaces are, you know, uh, children and young people and youth are in them. And so they're more than just the name of their school. They're the schools that young people go to for large segments of their day, right? Large segments of their life. And so I start the book off um, writing about this school and really trying to provide a uh, understanding of what this school space is like. And I introduced Kevin, who is a black male student at the school who had an experience where he um, was in the cafeteria line, waiting in line, 
um, and there was two white boys in front of him. Kevin is a black male. There was two white males in front of him and he was waiting in the lunch line to get some food. Um, and when he got up to the, you know, the serving area, um, the cafeteria worker closed the line, the line down right in front of him, right in his face. Um, so he's looking at her kind of stunned, but she doesn't even make eye contact with him. She's acting like he's not even there, like right? he's not even visible to her. So he's upset. He goes, he tells the, um, at the time, the associate principal, who is a black woman named Ms. Moore, I call her Ms. Moore in the book. And, you know, he's kind of like distraught, like, you know, I can't believe what happened. He's telling her, you know, what happened to him just now. And she says, well, you know, Kevin, let's go, let's go figure this out. Let's go talk about, it. let's go find out what's going on. So they go to the cafeteria worker and Ms. Moore says to her, excuse me, I need to understand why you did not serve this young man when you served two students who were right in front of him. And a cafeteria worker looks at Ms. Moore and says, I thought he was gonna want a whole meal. And Ms. Moore said, even if he wanted a whole meal, what's wrong with that? Why would you close the line right in front of his face? And she thinks about it. And then she looks at Kevin and she says, I can give you some soup. And Kevin says, I don't want soup anymore. I don't want it now. I just want you to know that I know what you did. And Ms. Moore says, are you sure you don't want to eat? And Kevin says, I'm not hungry anymore. And so I tell that story because I really, in the book, try to elevate um, and paint a picture of a school community that was predominantly white, um, but has had an increasing number of black and brown students in the school um, who have had experiences that have been damaging and harmful that are continually erased. And so Kevin had this one experience, but what I try to capture and try to convey in the book is that this is a school where there were Kev people who had Kevin-like experiences on an ongoing daily basis, what I call throughout the book, mundane violence. So you can move forward. Um, so what I argue in this book is that we're up against a pretty substantial problem in US schools. And it's, it's that most schools don't have and won't achieve outcomes for black students and for many other uh, racially minoritized students as well. Um, but I argue that this is not necessarily just from lack of effort, but rather most schools lack the knowledge and the capacity required to enact the kind of improvements that benefit young people like Kevin. And despite their efforts, they often remain stuck. And so what I do in this book is really try to paint a picture of what the experience is like for a school community to go through a process of trying to improve itself, trying to reform its community, so that students like Kevin are seen, are affirmed, have positive and affirming educational experiences, and that they have outcomes that are gonna set them up for the life potential that they have when they're born. So we can advance. Um, so really quick, I just wanted to provide a context of you know, when this study actually occurred and um, when I was writing. And so one of the things that I try to do is really put um, these very different emotions in each chapter. So when I was writing each chapter, I had a specific emotion in mind and I wrote the chapter with that emotion kind of like in mind. I started this project back in 2013, um, in the fall of 2013, on the, in the immediate aftermath of the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who was the uh, Florida resident who killed Trayvon Martin. Um, this was right around the time, June of 2013, was the time when the Black Lives Matter um, hashtag first emerged from three Black queer women and that process started to get moving. Of course, it didn't pick up until Ferguson, but really uh, the kind of bookends of this project are the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement a year before in 2012, the Million Hoodies movement. And fast forward to the year 2020 is when I was actually writing the book. And this was, of course, um, I was writing the book and wrapping up the book on the heels of the uh, racial justice protest um, that resulted from the, uh, the killing death of uh, George Floyd. And so this is important context because one of the things that I wanna kind of convey is that um, many school communities have been working to try to address these issues for many years, but the efforts to address the issues and their commitments didn't stem from just like, you know, just well-meaning people. It stemmed from a uh, national outrage um, against these injustices experienced by uh, black and other people of color. So we can advance the slide. So as I mentioned in 2013, um, I started this research project and it was a participatory research project in this predominantly, pr predominantly white community that was experiencing 
pretty substantial um, racial diversification of its student population. This is a school of about 1600 students, um, about 200 adults worked in the building. And basically me and my research team spent five years working in collaboration with the school to understand their efforts to you know, do better by its black and brown student population. Um, we started off with the model that was, we were very kind of hands-on and then we kind of like gradually released as we uh, built their capacity to kind of lead their own kind of continuous improvement and organizational development. And so that was five years, but after we left the field, I was very curious about would the work that we initiated um, sustain itself uh, once my research team was no longer involved. So I waited a couple more years and then we did retrospective interviews to talk to people about what were the most important and impactful experiences they had over the course of attempting to implement the equity reforms in their school. And many of the chapters in the book reflect what they talked about as the most important um, experiences they, that they um, had during that five year period and beyond as well. So we could advance. So the idea of stuck improving, um, I argue that it's a knowledge resource and it references multiple uh, kind of um, multiple different phenomena. And one thing that I like to, I wanna point out is I'm like a, I'm like a diehard qualitative researcher. So um, the idea of stuck improving came from people's actual language as they talked in the school. They would often say things in interviews like, you know, I know we're making improvement, but at the same time I feel stuck, you know, and then sometimes you would come and they would say like, we're stuck. And then I have a conversation with somebody else down the hall and be like, we're making a lot of improvement. So there was this continuous refrain of this idea of being stuck and improving. And it really captured um, the essence of what people were experiencing in terms of the dilemma of both making progress and not making process in the pursuit of racial equity. As I started to really analyze the data more deeply, I also began to understand that the idea of stuck improving is the conscious discovery that racial equity is not a tidy concept, it's something that you're always working on. And indeed, it shifts and changes the more you learn. It's almost kind of like uh, Erica Badu had this song. She says, you know, this world has changed since I've been conscious. The world itself, the material reality and everything might not be different, but by virtue of the learning and the engagement that people do, you see things in a new way. It's almost like, you know, I've never seen a red Mercedes before. And then I'll meet somebody who has a red Mercedes and all of a sudden I see red Mercedes everywhere. And so it's this constant ongoing discovery of new information that helps us begin to see the world anew and understand what's required to make a more racially equitable society anew on an ongoing basis. And finally, I argue that stuck improving is this process. It's a conscientious collective pursuit of learning and working to achieve a more racially equitable society. And in this particular case, a school um, through the ongoing practice, which is a key word of challenging the kind of violence of white supremacy in schools. So we can advance. Okay, and so the book is organized around um, these key concepts. So again, the main argument that I make in the book is that um, people want to improve their schools. They're given these charges to, you know, create better learning opportunities, adopt a culturally responsive school, I mean, a culturally responsive curriculum, engage in uh, culturally responsive teaching practices, so on and so forth. But what I've found is that the schools don't have the capacity to actually enact the reforms that are often called for or the reforms that they say that they want to actually enact. And this leaves them stuck improving. What I've identified and how the book is organized is organized into chapters that um, one of the, the final chapter is stuck improving, which is the knowledge resource. And all of the other resources um, are also uh, resources within the organization that are important to acknowledge, cultivate, and leverage for the purposes of racial equity improvement. So the way that I like to explain this to people is that if you were to go to a school community and say, we're gonna make this a STEM school, people would expect that there are gonna be certain resources and certain capacities that need to be developed in order to um, create a STEM educational experience and produce outcomes of people who are, you know, uh, chemists and engineers and mathematicians and so on and so forth. And so in the same way that you would, that you would expect a school who adopts a STEM curriculum or has a STEM reform initiative to um, have rulers, balance beams, labs, gardens, all of these materials, including the knowledge and intellectual materials, the people who understand STEM, people who have an affinity for STEM and a disposition and curiosity 
around how the world works. Um, though all of those resources are really important for that school to become a STEM school that sustains its effort, right? And so what I argue is that in the same way that we can think about the resources that exist that need to be present for a school to have a strong STEM curriculum, we could make the same argument, or I make the same argument that there's resources, racial equity resources that a school must acknowledge and cultivate if it's going to be able to advance in a deep way and sustain racial equity work as part of its um, school reform initiatives. And so what you see here on the screen, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, is kind of like the this is a figure that's in the sixth chapter of the book that identifies all of the racial equity resources that I write about throughout the book. And I call them a constellation of racial equity resources. If this was something that could move, it would kind of like move in and out. Different schools have um, different kinds of capacities. And so you can see in this particular bubble, the black and brown people's influential presence is a little bit larger than, for example, the curated white racial discomfort. And so how I think about this is this this process is always kind of moving in and out. And it's really kind of a conceptual framework to understand the conditions that exist within an organization that can help us understand when and why change actually occurs and the depth and expansion of the change that occurs, uh, specifically related to, uh, related to racial equity and improvement. So we can, we can forward. And so um, basically uh, what I did is again, uh, you know, I started the project um, in 2013, and I did this presentation at the school, and it was a it was a rough environment for Black and Brown people. And by the time we ended the um, project, through um, doing a lot of work to develop the capacities for them to implement the uh, the reforms that they uh, had, you know, chosen, um, I went back to the school in 2019. This was just before the pandemic. They asked me to do um, be a part of a social justice teach-in that invited community members, teachers, and students to partner to deliver workshops. And they asked me to come and deliver a workshop. And it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a precious moment because I delivered the exact same workshop to a group of students uh, in the first ninth and 10th graders, then 11th and 12th graders. Uh, so I did two workshops and this was the same exact workshop that I had given the very first time I ever visited to the school for an in-service um, teacher training. And I like to show this picture. I didn't take this picture. There was somebody from like the local news that was there taking pictures. And I ended up in a newspaper and I thought it was a trip because if you look in the picture to the left of what I'm, where I'm looking forward, you can see a poster that's up close to the top of the ceiling that just would not have been in the school um, you know, five or six years earlier. And so there was all of this kind of different visual culture and a different capacity to really talk about issues of race and racism um, and white supremacy in the school space. And uh, you can see that there's two white young males, I'm talking to them, and then there's a Black Lives Matter, Black Power Fist right in the background that they're looking at while I'm talking. And this is, a, to me, a very powerful image that uh, strikes a very different, uh, this very different from the school that I initially uh, came to and that initially invited me to support them on their effort to improve um, for their Black and Brown students. And so that's all I have. I'll, I'll leave it there and I look forward to any questions that you all have. Thank you. Thanks for um, that. That was, I mean, I, I'm sure folks are chewing on that right now. And again, I offer anyone uh, to raise anything in the chat. I, I do want to just kind of position us for a second because that's five years, a five year experience that you detailed and have had some really deep learning in and brought in a lot of shifts in practitioner uh, strategies, a lot of adaptive change. But something that I asked in our meeting, and I'm gonna ask again, uh, just for, for us, is um, how do you, as a black man, a black researcher, step into that space and be cognitive and metacognitive, so in and out within that space and leading for change and also stepping back and just doing the, the, the research work. You mentioned upbringing values, intellectual curiosity. How did you do that? That's, I, 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 how do you position yourself in that space without getting overly emotionally involved or not, uh, not stepping in and doing some, of the, doing some of the lift because you're still doing a research analysis? So maybe yeah. that's the first question that I wanted to position us so, in. 
Thank you. Yeah, I can't remember my initial kind of like responses. So I'll try to try to pick up. So I think part of it is, you know, I did mention my upbringing. Um, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so most of the racism that I witnessed at the school was like not new or surprising to me. Um, sometimes I think that I, uh, some people have told me that it might be a problem the way that I approach kind of like, you know, these issues because I expect a lot of this stuff. And so my reactions uh, are always, I guess I don't have like the deeper kind of emotion. I don't have the kind of emotional reactions to a lot of this stuff. A lot of it feels, um, makes me kind of curious, you know, uh, in problematic ways. Um, so I think the other part of it is that I'm a curious person. Um, I was invited into this study. Uh, I do participatory research. Most of my projects are not ones that I self-initiate. It's somebody saying, you know, would you want to work with us? Can you help us with this? And then I typically will say, well, that might be an interesting research project, right? That's how this um, started. Um, I do write about that process in the in the book, but they invited me in and the amount of access that I had as a Black man in this predominantly white community was like, you know, pretty unprecedented. I mean, I had very close relationships and I grew close to a lot of people, especially the leadership team at the school. I mean, we, we text and we talked on the phone and weekends and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It was a pretty, pretty close relationship with the folks who were there. Um, I think the, the closeness and the, the, the presence that I had there did make the research process um, much more difficult to take a step back and in particular to take a critical perspective. I was part of the work, so I know the effort that went into it. Um, you know, it differed from different people, but I have an understanding of the amount of effort that people put into it. And it was difficult and it was hard. So I started to develop a kind of um, understanding, not necessarily an empathy, right? But an understanding of like, you know, people's, the different and multiple ways that people struggle trying to do something like this as a member of a community. Um, and I had my own struggles. Uh, the hardest part I think was to get enough distance to write a critical book about people who I had developed relationships with. Um, I did that with the help and support of a community of people. I did focus groups. Um, I had a graduate research, two graduate research assistants who I invited to ask me tough questions and they would be like, are you kind of, you know, being a little, you know, nice here or is this really what happened? And so, you know, uh, that really gave me some distance to be able to um, write in a way that kind of captured, you know, what was happening. And it was super complex. I mean, I think that, you know, I, always, I tell people a lot of times that I didn't write, try to write, I tried to write this book as, as truthful and as honest as I could write it. That was my goal. Um, I did member checks, like really truly did member checks. Um, I know some people do a member check, like look at this transcript that we get all the words right. This was like, here's a full draft of the book, y'all. Read it, come to a focus group, not with me, talk to my research assistants and tell them what I got wrong and what I got right and what I could do better on. And it was interesting because they pushed on some things too. It was like, you know, you didn't, part of a major revision of the book was that they wanted to see me write my presence and my thoughts into the book much more substantially than what I did. Uh, so a lot of the kind of like more critique stuff came out and they were just like, you, you should do that because in some ways we know some of the things that you talked about and would say and how you talked and how you approach things is not reflected in the book. But that was my commitment to try to tell their story. And then I had to realize from them that they were like, you were very much a part of the story too. We need to hear your voice come through more in the book. Um, so yeah, we did member checks. Um, you know, they gave me feedback. These are people who I presented with for years as we led up to the book. This isn't something I just sat down and wrote. Um, you know, I was presenting these ideas for years and working with these ideas in multiple school communities for years. So um, yeah, but I mean, I think the emotional part of it is, you know, just, I knew that I had, what kept me in it is that I knew that I had a unique amount of access to this community, and it was probably going to be the first and the last time that I would ever have that much access in my life. Um, and so I was curious about what I was going to learn, what I would see, and I saw and learned like quite a bit. And I don't think that I would do a project like this again. I don't think I would be invited to. Um, and even if I was invited to, I think that the book and that sort of thing 
creates a different kind of relationship between who, you know, the people who I would be working with and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I knew that I just, I didn't even know what the story was going to be. I was just like, if these white people gonna let me watch them act crazy for five years, I'm going to sit there. You know what I mean? And I'm going to take some notes and I'm going to write about it when I'm done. If there's something good to write about. And, uh, but again, I saw like a lot of change. I would say one of the things that I appreciate most, which is difficult um, for most people is that I, I did spend five, you know, seven years doing this project with zero dollars, no funding, my own gas money, everything. The only thing is when we did an MOU with the district because people weren't funding equity leadership work in 2013, 14, 15, 16, or 17, you know what I'm saying? So I did all of this on my own. We had an MOU where the district would cover the cost of um, research related expenses. So all of my transcriptions, the district did all of my transcriptions of audio. I have like tons of audio. If we did a PE, PD, PD or something, or I was just sitting there talking with the principals or whoever, I always had a recorder on. So I have like so much data, but they transcribed all of that. I worked with the data specialist. So I had support from within the district. And what I asked them for was the ability to really kind of be autonomous in telling the story that I thought was truthful. And that was kind of our MOU. The other part of the MOU was let's stick with the process for um, up to five years, see what happens. And one of the things that I tell people all the time, if I would have ended the project during year three or probably year four, I would have wrote a book about abject failure. Um, but because I was able to stay with the project and then do retrospective interviews, you know, over, you know, six, seven year period, I, I, we were actually able to see change. And one of the injustices around research focused on racial equity is that funders don't provide the resources so that we can do the research that is actually going to help us understand how organizations and systems change because they only want to fund the stuff for three years. It's not long enough. That's basic. We know that from like all the organizational theory is that there's going to be a dip you know, policy dip, policy lag, things get bad before they get better. It takes five years, four, five, six, seven years to actually see what you started doing in years one, two, and three. And we didn't even know what that time horizon would be for a project focused on racial equity. But um, so, yeah, so I think that that's one of the things that I'm really proud of is really kind of sticking with sticking with the project. Um. So, I really appreciated that you um, uh, just discussed the complexities of the work. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to inquire was um, just because we're all getting back into the thick of things that are coming back from the pandemic. And so there's so many racial inequities that we have um, already known and some that are new to us that we're becoming more and more aware of. And um, in your book, you talk about uh, this uh, white discomfort that occurs. And so I was just wondering, can you share with the leaders on, on our and our participants, just uh, how do you disrupt? Um, just because there's so much um, anxiety and there's just uh, so much guilt and then there's so much frustration that's happening across the board in our classrooms. And um, I think everyone's trying to focus on a technical solution. Um, with students are at and where families are at and even where staff's capacity is at. So I'm just wondering what recommend, recommendations do you have um, to interrupt some of that white discomfort and really get to the nitty gritty of addressing some of these racial inequities that have come post pandemic? Mm -hmm. So I say that there's kind of two things, three things. Um, one is and I'm trying to figure out what is the best order to talk about these. First, well, let me let me start with the first one, which is. All right, I'm going to go backwards in a way that I would recommend it. Right. So the first thing is to have the organizational structures and routines to cultivate discomfort. Um, if you are in a organization that is underlying value is based on kind of like the psychological safety and comfort of the people there. Um, there's only so far that the people in that organization are going to go. I argue that there needs to be, uh, that we don't need safe spaces. We need like dangerously safe spaces. Um, and the idea of dangerously safe spaces that you need a place where you can like do dangerous stuff. 
Um, I try to write the book in a way that really, and I, and there was a point in a project where we shifted from how we even talked about the work they were doing to just be like, this is dangerous. It's, it's risky, so on and so forth. So I think part of it is to have the, um, the spaces that can cultivate that, which is why I write about them specifically as curated spaces. So this means a professional development and learning culture that is designed with the purpose of making sure people experience discomfort on an ongoing basis. Now this piece relates to what, thank you, Shamika. This piece relates to um, the, the importance of understanding in particular of adults and of white adults in particular, understanding that there is an inverse relationship between their psychological safety and that of, and well-being and that of students. Um, and so even if we think about this outside of schools historically, we know that in these moments of, you know, pretty radical, great discomfort. We're talking civil, in the United States context, we're talking civil war, talking, uh, you know, uh, World War I, World War II. We're talking, um, you know, civil rights movement, black power movement. These are the historic moments where white people have been discomforted and really jolted out of where they are. Um, these are also the moments where we've seen, you know, watershed momentous change for black folks, which unfortunately oftentimes only last for several years, you know, reconstruction, for example, um, civil rights movement, then we get into the 80s and we move into, you know, Reagan, conservative, you know, backlash and that sort of thing. So we see these patterns, but we know that they're generally in society as well as in schools, this uh, relationship where if white people are comfortable, black and brown people are suffering. That's what the issue is. And so the discomfort piece is to get to the point where folks are discomforted enough so that um, black and brown folks can be in a different place, not necessarily safety, safe necessarily, but at least at a point where they can speak up, they can voice out, voice their concerns and so on and so forth. And so those are two things. One is creating the kind of spaces of professional learning that cultivate discomfort and naming that that's what the space is intended to do not surprising people, but saying like, this is what this school, this is what we, this is what these spaces are intended to do. The second is the acknowledgement is that when you do that, things actually get better for young people because that discomfort is actually a resource. If you can be discomfort, if you can be uncomfortable and experience discomfort, that's a resource for people who you traditionally would have kind of like power over and that sort of thing. And then the final part I would say is, it seems basic, but like do the work, um, try things, do the work, um, we gave in the book, I write about these many challenges that we gave people as a process throughout the entire project. And it would be these things that we would ask people to do. We wouldn't say, we want you to believe in this and we want you to X, Y, Z. I used to do that. I used to do that. We started to instead just be like, I want you to do these things. The practice and the results that come from the practice are the things that shape people's beliefs. Um, and so that's what, you know, we started giving people these small things and it was interesting because I've done this like with even, uh, you know, whole office, like departments of public instruction and, you know, um, different states and everything. And they'll implement these processes where they give each other these racial mini challenges where they're doing things and then they come back, you know, they have a month to try something that they would not have otherwise done. They do it with a group of other people, say there's, you know, 20 people that are gonna take on this challenge. They go, they do the challenge, and they come back and they process what they learned as a process of being uncomfortable, doing something that was discomforting over an extended period of time, coming back and being able to talk about, here's what I learned from it. It creates possibility, doesn't always guarantee that you know, things are gonna work out how people want them to, but it gives them the experience of discomfort, which you know, tragically is the experience that people of color have walking into spaces all the time. You know? And so again, it's a different capacity because you know, if you are, um, you know, a person of color and you've had to walk into banks when we used to walk into banks, but you have to walk into banks, you know, for your whole life, you know what it feels like to walk into a bank, right? You're still going to go to the bank, even, or you're still going to go to XYZ, even if it's discomforting. Black and brown parents still come to the school, even if it's discomforting, because they have the capacity to deal with the discomfort that they're going to experience. And they also understand the benefits that come from experiencing that discomfort. And so people have had opportunities to do that from a young age, 
they've seen parents model it and that sort of thing. And what I found is that white people didn't have the same kind of learning opportunities and experiences from a young age. If they had them, most oftentimes, it was on their own volition and will. And it happened when they were like in you know, college. That's when it kind of started. And so in a way, I mean, simply put, people of color in terms of the capacity to deal with discomfort have, uh, you know, have m many more years of learning and experience than your average white person. And so that idea of discomfort and cultivating it as a resource is something that is intended to help people catch up to where black and brown folks are. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Irby. So um, we have, uh, we can go, cause we already have some questions in the chat. So we can go in that direction to give us some time since we're closing at six. Um, but we also had also planned for you to read a section of the book. And so um, what would you like to do? Um, either way is fine. I'm gonna let y'all let me know. It's all good. I can go with the book. William, would you like to just go ahead and just start with the Q&A in the chat? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, let's see. We have a question. I'm just wondering how, because you did your research at a high school. So um, this um, leader is just wondering, how do we start this conversation at the elementary level? What is yeah. that? Or is it any different? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, you know, um, kind of moving past the conversation, finding out whether there's a, enough people. Not everybody has to be on board. Everybody wasn't on board for this process. Matter of fact, it was a very small group of people who started of a staff of about 200. The work really got rolling with about, about 15 people. Um, and 15 people when working in concert can make a huge, huge change uh, in an organization. Um, and I outline how some of that worked in, in the book as well. But I think in a school, if there's a group, core group of people who are committed, um, you know, start with those folks, um, start moving forward and be kind and gracious enough to let people who wasn't down from the beginning to join in when they feel they're ready. Um, and really the important thing is to focus on what are the practices you wanna change and to avoid the uh, trap of having like beliefs based and idea based PDs and learning and really just say, to start to say like, what are some things we wanna to try to do differently and let the practices and the commitments to changing a particular kind of instructional practices, relational practices related to discipline, practices related to engaging with community and family. Those things are the things that people should focus on. And if you focus on those practices and you start to get, you know, a group of like, in this case, 15 teachers to start doing small little practices, we know from all of the research that uh, teachers in particular get most of their ideas and most of their improvement ideas from other teachers. So you get those 15 to roll and they have a different set of experiences. And part of that is getting them, giving them space to talk about what they're learning and what they're doing in front of their peers. And their peers become interested and say, oh, wow, you figured out how to deal with this particular issue. What are you doing? And they talk about what they did, why, so on and so forth. And we actually created um, an emergent process of how people talked about their changes and the things that they were doing. So you would report those things out. And then what would happen is, is that those 15 all have colleagues within the school that would you know, be interested and use them as resources for learning and improvement. And they would go to those people for ideas and they would say, here's the idea, here's what I've been doing and I can help you try to implement it and do the same thing. Um, and so that's kind of the approach that we use. And so I would say getting started is a matter of like, what are, what is a, you know, a, a, a challenge or what is an opportunity you know sometimes a lot of times in like improvement where we talk about the problems there's possibly also very good things happening in your school and if you can get people to commit to trying to adopt some of those practices um you know you just start there and i will say that you know it's important to be mindful of reaching this point where it's like it's this point in the organization where it's like 15 and it's like 60 people and now that's when you make you can make the announcement like, OK, we're, we're out the gate. We're doing this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and then, you know, it starts to kind of find its way into the whole school PDs in a way that it might not in like the first you know couple of years or a year or two when that smaller group of people are really kind of fortifying themselves with practices. So 
I don't know if that's a straightforward answer, but it's just kind of like you just get started. Well, awesome. Who wants to get started? Absolutely. And those of you that have not, or you're still processing your questions, whenever you're ready, just go ahead and put in the chat and then I'll share them with Dr. Irby as we go along. Um, and William, feel free to um, chime in when you, when you see fit. Um, see, another leader said, I appreciate the thinking on sustaining white discomfort. Building this across the staff must be intentional. I appreciate naming that this is the intent. Thank you. Thank you. And another leader just asked, what's an example of racial mini challenge that curated that white discomfort learning and led to different results? Yeah, so there's some examples in the book, but we actually would, um, mostly everything that we did, we would actually get the stuff from the school, right? So. Uh, some examples are like, okay, uh, you know, there's a student named Steven who is off the hook and it's, it's rough when Steven is, you know, in the classroom, right? Um, so we might have, so for example, a team of people who all have Steven would get a challenge, a mini challenge. It was like, treat Steven exceptionally well as though he is going to Harvard for six weeks. Treat his family like he's going to Harvard for six weeks. See what happens. So the challenges were very small. They were kind of like, you know, they weren't any kind of long, you know, you didn't have to have a plan. It was like, treat the student well, or it might be something like, call the student's parents and give them affirmations and tell them positive things about their child for, for four weeks. And so if you do that, I've never seen it not work. If you treat, you know, Stephen, well, for six weeks, Stephen changes and you change too. That's it. I don't even know how to put it. Now, the first week or two is a little kind of strange. And so we will learn, and it would be fun for people because they would come back and be like, wow, uh, you know, I, Stephen was surprised, you know, that we were, that I said nice things to him. And this thing start to slowly change. There was other, I mean, there's a bunch of examples. Um, there was one, there was a teachers who would yell at the students a lot. <laughs> they would just yell, like teachers be yelling. Um, so they actually gave themselves a challenge to talk in a calm voice to students for like four weeks. And just talking in a calm voice required them to do different things, be closer to the students, walk up to students, move through the space in a different way, get to students' levels in a different way. And just the practice and the awareness that I want to, and we are going to commit to not yelling for four weeks, totally changes the dynamics of the classroom. Totally changes the dynamics of students' willingness to learn. But it's interesting because initially it's very off-putting and it's difficult to get through the initial part of the change. But if people, when people would stick with it, it would um, really radically change what they a number of different things that they were actually doing. So those many many challenges could be anything. It could be related to grading and feedback. It can be uh, how you start your classroom, you know, how you start the day when students come into the classroom. Anything that you want to uh, focus on um, are important, but we really focused on things that would, that made people discomfort, uncomfortable and things that people didn't think were possible. And so, for example, when we talked about some of those students, we were specific in like, not don't just pick any student to be nice to. Pick the student that it's incredibly difficult to be nice to and be in incredibly nice, even if you don't mean it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Say nice things. Saying nice things produces something different, even if you don't believe it's going to work. And so that's examples of the kind of mini challenges that we gave. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that, because there were also challenges of how to um, interrupt some of that uh, passive aggressiveness among staff. So there were some many challenges that you had there that are in the book that are awesome to read. Yeah. Um, Dr. Irby, there's a section in that book we are going to have you read um, if you yeah. have it in front of you. Um, and I believe this is an excerpt from chapter four. Yes. Okay. And then we'll go back to Q&A. So those, again, if you are still processing your question, whenever you're ready, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll come back to that. Okay. All right, so um, this section is about, uh, it's in a chapter called Collective Awareness of Racial Emotions and Beliefs. And this was, it's in chapter four, but it was the first time that I really kind of inserted myself into the story in kind of like a meaningful, I guess you could say, way. 
Um, so it, it, it says, it, it reads as follows. Um, in 2015, 16 academic year, school board meetings were a flashpoint for confrontation. The district was under intense scrutiny for its improvement efforts. The previous year, the district quietly adopted a district-wide equity and continuous improvement policy. Advanced places classes had, classes had been integrated at the highest rates ever. Teachers who left the school still lived in and around the school and the high school was the talk of the town. Parents and local media crowded into Central Waters District Office boardroom to demand answers. What are you gonna do to get control of the school? The divisions that surfaced within the school a year earlier now existed in the community. The debates, divisions, and corners were identical. The people having them differed. Without saying it directly, parents armed with anecdotal accounts from students and teachers determined that the school's problems were black students' misbehavior at school. A newly elected school board member, a white male who had been a student at the school corroborated their claims. The dominant white narrative went like this. Administrative coddle disruptive black kids who would benefit from punishment, not support. The good students deserve support. Making the school more orderly and safer required removing bad students. The packed room of impassioned white parents regarded clear rules, consequences, and enforcement of rules, and the application of consequences as keys to getting things back in order. So when the district's new equity director, dean, school administrators, and school administrators asked me to offer the board expert testimony about the discipline and climate reforms, I half-heartedly agreed. I wanted to be a team player and to be supportive, yet I anticipated that none of the research I was prepared to present would matter. The problem was that although a preponderance of research evidence countered white parents' claims, their experiences and the ways they made sense of their experiences mattered more than any research study. Black and brown people could um, offer an experiential counter to their positions, but these people did not routinely attend board meetings. I sat in the front row with the administrators. I looked back and I noticed a black woman and a black teenage girl in attendance. For better or worse, and although I had never met or seen them in life, I found comfort in having them there. My presentation was well put together. Had I been at an academic conference, it would have likely been well received. Elizabeth and Ethan, the two administrators who I worked closely with, first provided an overview of the discipline, culture, and climate reform efforts at the school. I piggybacked by laying out research on the harms of zero tolerance error reforms, as well as the potential for restorative approaches to pave a new path for the school. I concluded by telling uh, the board that in many regards, the work underway at the school was cutting edge. It would take time and it was aligned with what was regarded as developmentally appropriate. As soon as the board floor op opened the floor for attendee comments, it was clear that this was not an academic conference. The public testimony kicked off. Parents and community members unleashed a fury of white rage. We sat and listened. My kids don't feel safe. What are you doing about it? This used to be a good school. You're letting those kids ruin the school. What are you going to do? This is unacceptable. I expected all of the racially coded comments. What I didn't expect was that the three person black community I imagined minutes earlier would become three black people at a board meeting. My name is Camille. I'm a 10th grader at the school and I'm here to talk about the problems at the school. There are students who are disrespectful to teachers, they curse in the hallway and they have no respect. They don't care about school and the administrators don't do anything. They know they won't get in trouble, so they don't care. I exchanged glances with Elizabeth and Ethan. What was happening, I thought to myself. We sat stone-faced and contemplative, listening to this courageous young black student speak her truth. As the racial universe would have it, Camille, one, out of more than 1,600 students just happened to feel so compelled to speak that she convinced her mother to bring her to a board meeting. She put her name on the comments list as she rightfully can and should have. And she used her two minutes of talk time to speak with passion and eloquence. She continued, most of the students who don't care are black. I care. They're probably not bad people, but maybe they just need some help or something. I don't know. But I just wanted to say that I think something should be done because they ruin the school for those of us who want to learn and they make black students like me look bad, like we don't care. I do care. Students speak your truth. Your voice matters. We have said all those things for years. Well, we ate our own words, swallowed our own actions and tasted our own recommendations. 
We never collectively processed Camille's accounts. So I can't speak for Elizabeth and Ethan, but I personally was annoyed. I appreciated Camille's initiative, but I was annoyed at the chance of it all. Why now? Why Camille? Why, why, why? How inconvenient a time, place, and audience for her remarks. It was later than I usually remained at the district and I had a long drive ahead of me. I thank people for listening to my remarks and I proceeded to quietly sneak out to the parking lot. I was more than halfway to my car when I heard a voice behind me. Excuse me, excuse me. I just wanted to tell you that we are not racist. We are not racist. And you're here making my kid think she's racist and she's not. This school used to be a good school. I raised my family here. We've been here. We work hard and we're not racist. As more people trickled into the parking lot, they slowed their steps to listen in. Some kept moving, some stopped to give their full attention. Those who stopped nodded in agreement, co-signing her words. I stood and listened. She continued inching closer and closer to me. It's not true. You think you know something because you read a research study. Well, you, I know I'm not a racist and my daughter is not racist. She put her head down, she started to cry. A white man put his arm around her to console her. As I stood, I glanced up to see Camille's mother standing a short distance away. The white woman looked back up and pointed her finger at me and pronounced to the onlookers, he needs to stop lying. She looked at me and I calmly replied, I appreciate that you share how you're feeling. That was something we used to do at school, by the way. <laughs> and I turned and I walked to, and walked to walk away. I scanned the parking lot and caught eyes with Camille's mother. She maneuvered through the dispersing crowd. That was an interesting exchange, Come on, Camille's mom said, now with their arms reach. She's drunk as hell, I smugly replied. You see, the other woman had been close enough for me to smell, breath, smell her breath as she talked. Camille's mother and I shook our heads at the absurdity and giggled like old friends. The three seconds or so of mutual laughter eased the discomfort and pain of the prior interaction. It was just enough to make room for affirmation. Camille's mom said to me, Dr. Irby, I wanna thank you. I'm glad you're here. I appreciate the work you're doing at the school. The school has a lot of issues and I don't think they could do it alone. Your presentation was spot on. They're benefiting from you be, to being here. I don't disagree with my, I don't agree at all with my daughter. And I try to help her understand how her thinking is actually part of the problem, but she has her own mind and I encourage her to use it. I support her in expressing her voice. I'm interested in talking more about her and talking more with her, uh, more with her about tonight. She'll get it as she gets older. At any rate, I wanted to thank you and encourage you to hang in there and keep it, keep up the good work. I replied, it, replied, thank you. I really appreciate it. Camille's mom said to me, safe travels on your return home. And I said, thank you so much. About five minutes after I left the building, I was in my car. Finally, it dawned on me that I was drained. As I buckled my seatbelt, Self-doubt, disbelief, and frustration flooded my emotional wood up. What, did, this, did this white lady just confront me in the parking lot? I turned my attention to oncoming traffic as I waited to turn right out of the parking lot to race back home. I couldn't get out of Central Waters fast enough. Yes, she did. She definitely confronted me in the parking lot. My internal dialogue was scattered. I felt disrespected, angry, and embarrassed. Then I felt exhausted, then inadequate. Over the duration of my drive home, I felt defeated for a span of 10 minutes. Then for the next five, I laughed at the absurdity of the whole situation. Perhaps my attempt to find humor in the episode was a means to smooth over my hurt, to keep myself from crying or being overcome with hatred. I remember the warmth of Camille's mother and the way she, a black mother, knew exactly what to do to offer me respite in a moment of racial duress. So I felt appreciative. Then anger crept back in, white trash, I thought. As much as I wanted to find calm, my emotions and thoughts refused to be still. It was unwieldy racial discomfort. I pondered, why do I keep driving all the way out here? And I told myself, I don't have to do this. Thank you. Wow, uh, yeah, I'm just, Holding that, I was um, just breathing. I have a lot of emotions to that uh, because uh, there's 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 a lot right there, and I, I truly appreciate you sharing that. 
and I'm sure every time you read it, it draws those those emotions. And um, I, I I do want to ask because there was a question that kind of fits with this, but let me I'm gonna go there. But I I also want to this kind of goes to one of my first questions. And one of the first questions, when you were driving away, how did you, how did you fit yourself into that situation? Like, where did you want to go from there? Did you want to go into, uh, we need to do this work. Does it strengthen you? Did you want to just say, I'm, I'm out. I'm trying to get to the feelings of this as well, because this isn't just, this is amazing work and beautiful work, but there's feelings that this work brings up for us as black folk and as people of color. And this was a moment where you were in the heat of that. So can you uh, address that a little bit, the feelings? And then I do have a question from um, Manal Alalanzi. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole, uh, the entire chapter is about awareness of racial emotions and beliefs. Um, and I don't think until, until I wrote, started writing this piece out, I really hadn't focused in on kind of like my own not in a systematic way, my own kind of emotional experience with the project. Um, but I mean, I think I kind of tried, you know, my best to describe it there. I mean, really, I was all over the place. And it really kind of depended on, you know, what day, what happened. Some, you know, I felt discouraged. So, you know, one of the interesting things about this piece, and it was interesting, uh, Dr. Ishimaru Ann mentioned this to me. She was like, that passage is like, you know, encapsulates a lot of what the entire book is about, you know what I'm saying? And I, didn't, I never thought about it that way. I was like, yeah, it, it actually does. So everything that I was describing there, like the highs and the lows and like, yeah, I use this research and I'm an expert. And, you know, the, why I tried to describe the glances and all that kind of stuff, like that really was a hour long, you know, I condensed it down to, you know, that passage, but it was like an hour long, but that was the story of the entire project. Like, you know, every other, every six months, I was like, I ain't coming back out here. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, I'm not doing this. I ain't got to do this. You know what I mean? Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a survey. I'm gonna do a survey research project and write some articles and get tenure. You know what I mean? I ain't doing this. You know. Uh, and then you know, a phone call or a conversation of just be like, we got to get in here. We got to keep going. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it was just all over the place. You know, I never cried throughout the entire process, which is kind of surprising. But I was, and I wasn't really angry most of the time. I think that the um the that particular experience, I think it was something about this time I was out in the district, a lot of times my research team would be there with me. Um, and it was a research team. My research team was, it changed over time, black, black woman, white woman, a multiracial uh, research team. And a lot of times we were in a car together, so we would be able to process when we were coming back. But in this particular instance, because they wanted me to stay late for a board meeting, you know, I was there by myself and um, or either I stayed after or something for a board meeting. Everybody else like, you know, we got to get back home. And so my reflections I captured this time because I turned on my audio recorder in the car and just talked out loud while I was driving. And so I was able to capture the emotions of the moment because I could hear my voice and I knew kind of like I had, a, I had the audio of the kind of like my reactions to it at the moment, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I just turned on the recorder and just talked into the recorder and I did a lot of cussing. It's not in the book, you know what I mean? Um, the, pro the whole project had a lot of cussing in it, by the way, like educators cuss a lot, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. uh, so I took a lot of that out and kind of like tried to soften some of the language, but it was a lot of cussing going on and a lot of cussing into the audio recorder and name calling and that sort of thing. And I thought that part of it in the book was, um, it was important, you know, the little, the white trash piece, you know, I didn't know if Harvard was going to let that, you know, was going what they were going to say, but I was like, you know what, it could be worse. This is the, this is the PG version. Um, let me put this in here because people need to know, readers need to understand, um, you know, the emotions and the reactions, you know what I'm saying? Um, whether it's something that when you look back on it, you can be proud of or not, you know, um, you know, the anger, you know, um, and then like the question becomes, what do you do with it? And so, yeah, so, it, you know, my emotions were all over the place. The entire project was very similar to this particular moment. And I just wish that there was a way, and I try to do it in the book to really kind of convey like the glances and the, 
the body language as best as I can by trying to write in a way that kind of like brings people into the community and how our body language was. And we like glancing at each other, like, what is she doing? You know what I mean? Um, and the questions, a lot of the questions, like, why is this happening? What is going on? You know what I mean? It was a lot of that throughout the entire project. So I tried to write it in a way that makes it so that people don't feel like they're alone or, you know, they're being angry or they're calling people names and stuff like that when they're in the privacy where, you know, the name calling isn't going to harm anybody. You know, right. sometimes you go into the room and you can close the door and cuss everybody out and it's good for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So um, I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, I mean, it does. I and, and I, and man, thank you. The presence of mind to even consider to record yourself while you're going through that. That's, I should do that more often. That's pretty amazing. Um, so I have a question from, uh, thank you for that and for sitting sitting there with your emotions for a minute. It's super helpful for me and I'm sure for others as well. Um, so Manal Alalanzi, uh, my sister, one of my uh, folks that I work with uh, in, in our district does amazing work for our district. Um, if you're there, Manal, you can go ahead and raise this and jump in. Uh, but if not, I'll ask this question for you because this is this this SPS. We 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 have we're doing a lot of this work, but we have a lot of white spaces as well that are pushing this work. And so she asked a pretty uh, a, a strong and preemptive question. So she asks, I appreciate you sharing your collaborative process and emphasis on sharing their stories through your research when conducting research to help share their, the stories and perspectives of practitioners on their racial justice journey? How have you grappled with inserting your research and lived perspective? For example, if you are working with staff, white or BIPOC, and you find their framing and story are lacking a strong racial analysis or maybe perpetuating false narratives, how do you handle that considering, sorry, considering your specific role in the collaboration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I especially in that chapter, this was a the racial emotions and beliefs chapter was one that is, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, you know, a lot of it I kind of grounded in this idea of like this radical idea of belonging, like a radical kind of belonging, trying as hard as possible to treat people like they belong, even if you disagree with them. Uh, you know, um, and yeah, so I think some of it was just like being willing to kind of like listen and have people have the opportunity to kind of share and reflect. I write in a book about a conversation I had with a woman named Carla, who, you know, had, you know, these problematic racist beliefs, who, by the way, was a person who was like a champion for the racial equity work that was happening from like the day I walked, the day we started, you know, she was like, let's go. I've been trying... I've been trying to find a team to do this. Let's go. And, you know, we're talking four, three, four years into the process. I learned through just a, you know, chance conversation with her because she was one of the people who I would actually go to at the school to say like, hey, what's up? Because I felt like she gets it, you know what I mean? And um, she was having a rough day and she started saying some stuff. It was, you know, racist, racist, racist beliefs, racist belief system about what she deserved and who didn't deserve. It was about hiring, about some hiring practices that the um, school had adopted. And I think by this time we had developed the kind of relational trust and relationship where I was just gonna just, you know, I was kind of just like not telling her what she needed to do or how she needed to think, but I just kind of told her about, you know, my perspectives. And a lot of this came through the practices we had adopted over time. So it wasn't foreign to her, like I was trying to do some kind of weird trick on her. But I was like, well, you know, if you don't mind, I'm happy to, if you're willing, I'm happy to share, you know, my experience that relates to this X, Y, Z. And so I just talked to her about, you know, some experience that I had in life. And that could have gone very different if I would have either cut her off or if I would have just been like, nah, you wrong, right? <laughs> you know, it could have went differently, but I was just like, yeah, I said, okay. And I said, you know, I have something that I would like to share. Here's how I think about it. And I just talk through it from things from my perspective. And I talk about this and write about it in a book is like this idea of uh, racial self-talk where you're talking out loud. And so she had the opportunity to like talk out loud about the ideas that were, you know, in her mind and her emotions, right? And I just listened 
And what I found to be very interesting is that a lot of people in the school, when they had the opportunity to talk out loud, not just write, but if you write, you have to speak it out. When they spoke and they talked about their ideas, they were actually had the ability to understand the flaws in the, in the ways that their own kind of thinking was racist without like being directly told, you know what I'm saying? Cause someone, you know, it's like, uh, I used to give this activity to, um, you know, I worked in South Philly. I used to work at a, a life skills center with adjudicated youth. And I mean, like, um, you know, the music, you know, I would just be like, y'all, this is kind of like, kind of polluting to the classroom. Can we not cuss so much X, Y, Z? They would be like, oh, it's just music. It's just a song. One day I brought in a whole bunch of lyrics to their favorite song. I was like, stand up in front of class and read that. And without the music and without the beat, they read it. They was like, this is awful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so they were just like, yeah, we hear it now. And after that day, I never had to focus on the language pollution in, in, in the classroom environment anymore. They self-regulated because they understood. And it was just a matter of like, hear yourself. Listen to yourself repeating what this person is saying. And so for the people, a lot of them was just like, if they could listen to their self, they would literally catch yourself, you know, mid-sentence, mid-thought and be like, oh, oh, you know what? I'm sounding real meritocratic right now. Uh, ah, you know, so they could do that because they had the, the language and that sort of thing, but just the application of it to their own thinking. People needed time to, to work it out themselves, you know? Um, so I guess that's, you know, one of the to things to think about, which, by the way, it's hard for me to support <laughs> um, because I don't want to hear that. And I don't think that uh, most people want to hear that, but it's people's journey um, and the opportunity for them to talk about these things out loud again. in a, you know, it's a risk and it's a dangerous space um, for people to be in. Um, it's a risk, but if they're willing to take the risk, it gives them different kinds of opportunities that we have because most people can't talk about this stuff in a context where they can change their mind in the moment, right? Because it's even a risk to change your mind or to shift gears in the moment, right? You can't really do that at home. People be like, well, you said this yesterday when you did that X, Y, Z. And so people just really need a lot of time to like process and talk out loud. Um, I found that to be a very, very powerful thing. It was a very difficult and awkward chapter to write um, because it was almost like I was really just sharing people's reflections and you know, conversations that were out loud that didn't really have what we would think of as a traditional intervention. The intervention was the opportunity for them to talk out loud. Thank you. Shanisha, you want to take that last one? Or can you? Yes, um, there was one other question and prompt that had came up. I apologize if we didn't get to it earlier, um, but a leader had asked, what are there additional learnings that um, people of color can explore more deeply? Additional learnings that people of color can explore more deeply? Um, you know, I think like it's, if you're talking about specific resources, I mean, I think there's a lot of really dope stuff out now, um, you know, kind of take your pick. I mean, I think my book is amazing. So that would be one. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think one of the most important things, and I write about this quite a, quite a bit, I write about this a lot in the book, is like using your own local context as the primary text for your learning. Um, the stories of what happens in your everyday life with the people who you see on an everyday basis, with the people who you walk past, the stories are all there. The text is there. And one of the things that I think made the learning process is that Central Water so powerful is that we did not use case studies or anything from any other schools. We didn't have a textbook. We, you know, there was things that people read. Later on, they adopted like uh, Zaretta Hammond's book. So, you know, they adopted different books and they did readings. And we read, you know, everything from like stuff from Jeff Duncan Andrade to all of these different people and that sort of thing. So we read a lot of stuff. But in terms of really digging in, we always said that the primary text of study was the lived experience and the history of the school itself. And the more you could use that as the primary source of information. And so concretely how that translated was like, we took, um, and I don't know if this is specific to black and brown people, it could be, um, but 
what we would do is like we organized our PDs around things that happened in the school. So if we knew we had a PD coming up in March, in January, we was like literally in the school, like what's been happening? What's going on? What's, what, what can we learn from? And we would get the information and we would go talk to the people who it happened with. If an incident happened in the class and we wanted to use that, we get it. We write up the cases and stuff from that and bring that to the PDs. Now, in the early years, this created a lot of tears. I mean, like people was devastated and crying because the whole school community is processing what seemed like what could be considered an experience like a failure, somebody's failure a lot of times, right? Um, but in time, people started to understand I had this issue and this challenge. It's a learning resource for other people to learn from too. So we always did this process of like mining the school community for things that were happening and brought those back to use as kind of like our primary text for PD. That included like the data being the text, um, the local history, understanding what happened in the past, even though, of course, you can never get like a holistic full story, but we could get these stories that were good enough for people to ask questions and engage in conversations. So, so it allowed them to not, it allowed them to have to own what was happening and to learn from what was happening. And the power is that if you know what's happening and you can learn from it and it's in your local context, you can change it. As opposed to reading a book about case studies that happened way over there, and you can be like, that's messed up what's happening over there. Well, actually, the same thing happened two weeks ago here. So let's focus on the thing that happened two weeks ago here. And so, um, you know, I write about that in terms of especially the curated right, the racial discomfort is learning from the things. And one of the key features of the PD is being able to learn from the things that are happening within that, that local context in that community. And it's interesting because even though the book is a deep kind of like ethnographic study of like one school community, the feedback that I've been getting from people like all over the country is that like, it's exactly like my school. These things happened at my school. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm hoping that you all understand that there's uh, a lot of learning opportunities from what happens at your school on a regular basis. Absolutely. All right, our last question for the evening is, if you have the chance to do anything different uh, in your study or add something to your book, what would it be? Mm. I don't think I would do anything different. I'm long-winded, as you all can tell. I would have uh, I would have wrote more about the um, context in which the study happened. Um, there was a little bit in terms of like wanting to write a book. I came into the book wanting to write something that would um, age well, and so um, there was a little bit of calculation around like how much I would spend on Trump presidency and election, which I cover it here, but it's not super prominent. Trayvon Martin, Ferguson, those things aren't super prominent. All of that stuff was happening. And I give like little hints of it, but I don't spend a lot of time writing about a lot of the kind of broader context, both national. I didn't write about the local state context because it would have revealed the, you know, the us. Uh, it would have helped people narrow down to where the uh, study site is. And so it would have kind of been um, a breach of kind of some of the commitments to confidentiality for this particular school community. So I didn't write about the state context stuff. And I also didn't write around district context stuff. And the district context piece was very interesting because a lot of people are interested now, especially in 2020 and beyond, people are interested in district level, what district you know folks can do. And the district played a role in supporting the work, but this was not something that the district initiated. This was, the district was transformed through the work that happened at the school. So it actually was like a more ground, you know, case of this school. And then what this school was learning, the other school started to adopt. And actually the district started to move and promote people who had been involved in the work to other schools as building leaders and that sort of thing. And so that's how they actually started to proliferate all of the kind of equity practice. And they would take this, all of the many challenges, the way that they're designing curated right racial discomfort, they would take those to the school that they went to because they had been a part of it for, you know, three years. And so that's the process that happened. Um, the district is very different now. And, you know, contrary to how you think about most district reform where the district provides a lot of support, this is a situation where there was this school and it was just like a lot of stuff going on. They just let the, because, partly because the school had site-based management initially, the school district just let the school kind of like try to work through some of these reforms, but then started using the school kind of like as a site 
and as a resource for the learning that needed to take place in the other schools. So I wish, I think that that, was, that is probably the part that I wish I would have had more room to write about. Um, but you know, if you're working with like editors, there's, you know, page limits. And I was like, you know, thousands of pages over when I needed to start editing. Um, and I actually had to negotiate a little bit more, you know, pages and words than I actually got. But that's the thing that I would want to write over, but in turn, write more about, but there's not much that I would want to um, do over. I did ask the participants, the people at the school, one of the questions that uh, my research assistant interview people about me because I wanted to understand the role of researchers in this kind of like improvement process and what could researchers do. And um, they, they had things that they, not a lot of things, but the main thing that they said they would have done differently was require more people to get involved, like mandated it earlier on, which is interesting because I don't, but then they would also say, but I don't know if things would have worked out the same because it would have been more resistance. We didn't have a lot of resistance at certain stages because people had the freedom to come and go. So you might have somebody who was there, a part of the team, they get exhausted, they leave, they might come back a year later. You know what I'm saying? So people are moving in and out. And that wasn't by design. That was because of the IRB rules. Because I wanted to record everything. You had to be there. If you were in the room, we were recording, right? You were part of the data collection process. And so the, the voluntary aspect required by IRB is what shaped who was involved and people coming in and out. But it actually ended up working really well. But the number one thing that like mostly everybody in the school said I wrote about this in the book, which was kind of amazing to me, is that um, most of, there were people who did not go through, there was this initial kind of training that was like very, very difficult for people that uh, we started with early in the process that was very discomforting and very hard. I guess, you know, I could say it was probably kind of harmful to people. Yeah, thank you for the IRB Institutional Review Board. Um, but people talked about needing to go through this fire, needing to go through this pain in order to transform. Um, and people said that that was the most powerful thing that changed how they moved. And then there were people who didn't participate in the early years when things were real crazy that said, I wasn't actively involved in, if I could go back as painful and as awful as it sounded, I would have wanted to go through that process because the people who went through that process are the ones who catalyzed up catalyzed all the improvement and changes that we see in our school community. So that was that was shocking to me that um, people would kind of in a sort of way wish on themselves this painful experience, this hard experience, because they saw how it transformed other people so much so that they were just like, if I could go back, I would be involved because I would I would have wanted that kind of transformation for myself. And they said that they think the school community would have progressed faster had more people had that kind of experience earlier on. That was very surprising to me. Well, thank you, Dr. Irby. That was super like eye-opening and, and, and um, I don't know, I think someone said it was like fascinating. It really is. Um, and I appreciate you just acknowledging the uh, significance of the privatizing like our classrooms and our buildings and, and what, and have a wet, how that evolves um, people's um, profession and just adaptive change. Um, so what we're gonna do now, since it's 556, we're actually gonna begin to um, transition to closing. So Anne, I'm gonna have you jump on and talk a little bit about what is coming up next. Thank you so very much. Um, I, this is that point where I can say, um, if you've enjoyed tonight's session, wait, there's more. So um, we don't want you to feel like this is it for you. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to uh, purchase this book by Dr. Irby, then I would recommend that you do because it's, it is, um, your voice comes through so very clearly in this book. It is like sitting with you um, when you are reading it. So I, I have to say, if it gives you a few more hours with Dakota, <laughs> if you would like to have some more time with Dr. Irby, um, please grab the book. Um, the other pieces that we'd like to talk with you about is that um, we have uh, Dr. William Jackson and Janisha Way will be back again on April 25th um, with a roundtable discussion. Um, for those of you who have been our participants tonight, you will have the ability to chat. Your video will be live. 
you'll have an opportunity to really engage in conversation across each other. And I think that that's a really important component of this work that we be able to engage deeply with each other. Um, and also, if you've appreciated just the um, the fire and the truth and the wisdom that you heard from Dr. Irby, this will be a time to talk about how you are putting that into your practice, um, particularly around the idea that um, Dr. Irby, I think you write about so well in this as in this book as well about how um, practices really um, propel beliefs rather than the other way around. And so we really want to be focusing a bit about how are we putting this in our practice? How are people taking this work into their work? Um, we also have more sessions coming up. Um, we want to say thank you to the Corbley family for the um, financial support that they've given, and then also to our, um, our upcoming uh, session presenters that we will be having coming in. Um, so on May 16th, please join us um, for Dr. Robin uh, Zeptahola Al Minthorn and Dr. Annalise and Dr. Cornell uh, Pawardi, who will be coming in um, to talk about unsettling settler colonial education, the transformational indigenous praxis model. Um, we will also have um, a follow on session with that that will be led by Dr. Anthony Craig, Dana um, Arviso, um, who's part of our L4L, um, excuse me, part of our PhD candidate with us as well. So uh, really don't want you to feel like this is the only chance that you have uh, to be part of this work. And so um, super appreciative of everyone for joining us tonight. Um, for putting your questions in the chat um, and also for you to take this work forward in the work that you're doing in your schools and your districts and your organizations and in your heart. So um, thank you again everyone for joining us and we hope to see you back again with us uh, next month on April 25th when we have our follow-on roundtable conversation. And we, I just also want to just highlight Dr. Irby, thank you for being just so transparent and vulnerable and just sharing all your thoughts. And uh, I just appreciate you acknowledging that I cuss a lot because I be feeling like that's unprofessional, but now I know that's part of the job. So I feel good. I feel really good. <laughs> Great. I share my appreciation too. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for everyone for being here tonight. <laughs>